committee, senior members present here and my dear professional colleagues. Speaking on this subject on governance, I thought I would pick up some of the latest happenings with respect to ethical ethics and what is happening in the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. Also, what are our primary duties with respect to standards on auditing? And in that sense, I thought as auditors, we would be complying with what is expected as governance from us as a profession. I read in the media today and I was told by my friends that we had a very scintillating address by the former Chief Justice of India yesterday. And I sincerely missed attending the function yesterday as I was occupied in another branch for a similar program. But this conference inaugurated in the hands of the Honorable Chief Justice, past Chief Justice of India. I'm sure the deliberations yesterday and today would help in formulating our thought process with respect to various matters which affect us as a profession. Friends, you would have also seen recently Ministry of Corporate Affairs has come out with a draft paper, a consultation paper. They have asked from stakeholders various questions as to how the audit profession should be carried out in future. There are very far-reaching suggestions or issues which have been put up in that consultation paper. So while we know that the regulatory aspects have been strengthened by way of implementation of the National Financial Reporting Authority, by way of uh, additional penalties which are prescribed for auditors in under the Companies Act 2013, amendments made in the Income Tax Act, providing the right to an assessing officer to impose penalty on a tax auditor, so on and so forth. That consultation paper has some suggestions which are in the interest of small and medium practicing firms too. The issue which they have raised is, is it that the Indian audits are dominated by few of the firms who are popularly called as big four firms. And what should be done to see that the width and depth of this profession also participates in the audits of large listed companies. So one of the suggestions which has been doing rounds everywhere is why not have joint audits? Why not have a empanelment process for appointment of auditors? So there are a lot many things which are happening. Our institute has come, council has come out with guidelines saying that if there is a tender and it is restricted only for statutory audits, so which is a tender which is meant only for chartered accountants, then chartered accountants can participate, auditors can participate only if the minimum fees is prescribed. If you look at what is happening worldwide and we cannot ignore because we are a large country. Today we are the fifth or the sixth largest economy in the world. So we cannot always think from the point of view of small and medium firms like us. In the United Kingdom, in, the England, in England, they say that there is uh, like we have rotation of auditors even in UK, they have now rotation of auditors. The period under the Companies Act is five years. The partner changes, the firm can be appointed for another five years. If it is a proprietary firm, then only for a period of five years. UK, the principle is different and that is what is being followed in the entire European Union. They say if at the time of appointment of the auditors, did you carry out a public bidding for that audit? And through the process of public bidding, have you appointed the auditors? So while we are at one stage looking at public bidding tender process from a negative point of view, in the sense that in the public bidding, the fees comes down very dramatically, very drastically. There are some of our members who quote for some work, which is otherwise all of us feel is too low of fees for which a chartered accountant should not be working for such a work at few hundreds or thousands of rupees. And 
the responsibilities are enormous. So Reserve Bank of India concurrent audit requiring at least three or four chartered accountants working for a month, the fees could be hardly 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 in different parts of the country. The responsibilities for the concurrent audit are very high. So it was in that background that the council brought in this guideline that there should be minimum fees which should be prescribed by the person coming out with the tender. Whereas in UK, they are saying that if you have done a public bidding, then you can appoint that auditor for a longer term and rotation will be after a longer time duration. So maybe they have not experienced the ill effects of tendering which we have experienced. They may become wiser after some time and after some period of time, they may revise their way of working in accordance with what we are doing. But today as the situation stands in the European Union, public bidding is, is an accepted methodology for appointment of auditors. Whereas we believe that the auditor's independence is being impaired if the auditor is appointed through a bidding process because the auditor is uh, quoting very low fees and uh, there are so many events which come out of this tendering process. So in a fast changing global economy, in a fast changing global situations, we will also have to move forward. So this paper, consultation paper issued by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs is talking about joint auditors, appointment from empanelment process and various other matters which they have put up for comments. Our institute is also in the process of preparing a response to that paper. But it would be interesting and it would be advisable that all of us have a look at that and give our suggestions at least through the branch so that what we believe should come out should be reflected in the response which the institute gives to the government of India. <laughs> now in that background, some of the aspects with respect to governance and some of the key points with respect to auditing I propose to take up in this session. <coughs> now, what is governance is doing the right thing in the right way so that the stakeholders at large are benefited. One of the very common example which is given is that when we are being watched, we do the right things. But the issue is, do we do the same things when we are not being watched? One example which is quoted very often is that if you are driving, if there is a red light, <coughs> invariably all of us stop at that place until the red light becomes yellow and then green. But if in the middle of the night, if you are driving and there is nobody on the road, if there is a red light, <coughs> would you still stop or would you pass by? One of the responses in a place like Indore is that if you have a red light, you will have a red light. If you have a red light, you will have a red light. If you have a red light, you will That is also a reality. But governance is doing what is expected of us to be done at all times, whether we are being watched or we are not being watched. This sentence is what I recently heard in one of the seminars in a conference organized by Confederation of Asian and Pacific Accountants and they said that professional institutes need to do not what members want but what members need. So, honestly as a member I may not like to have so many auditing standards imposed on me I would not like to have so many ethical standards imposed on me because they are affecting my flexibility in carrying out my professional activity. While all of us like to attend seminars, but if it is mandated by way of a continuing professional education, many of us may not like it or a quality review, peer review process. So this is not what we want, but the institute has to do it because this is what the profession needs. So the institute has to do what is needed and not necessarily what is wanted by the members. For the simple reason as an individual, I would not like to have so many restrictions imposed on me, which collectively all of us believe that 
yes it should be there for the purpose of proper growth of the profession so ethical standards will generally be far more stringent than what is the legal requirement it is said that ethics is above law and therefore we say that follow the law in letter and spirit what is actually intended in many ways in our country we have been following certain ethical practices which have been far ahead of other western worlds a common example is that in our institute we had a position right if i remember and my seniors can correct me right since 1949 when our profession was established by way of act of parliament that an internal auditor and a statutory auditor have to be two different entities a statutory auditor cannot do internal audit whereas in the developed economies this was permitted it was only in the year 2002 when the united states brought in the sarbanes oxley act after the enron crisis that the position changed and they also said that started talking about audit services and non audit services so what are the kinds of non audit services what are the services which an auditor cannot render to his auditing client and that is how this concept of audit services and non audit services has begun so what came in us and other western economies in 2002 was implemented in our country by our institute way back 60 70 years ago so on ethical matters we can probably say that our profession has been following stringent ethical norms right from beginning however if we look at it more minutely at times i believe that the ethical requirements have been stringent because the implementation of law has not been as stringent in india as against the way it is imposed and implemented in the western world it is a matter of fact that the process the legal process which we have and for various reasons the court cases the tribunal cases the institutes disciplinary cases keep on happening for a long period of time this is a general criticism of the indian judicial system and the institutes disciplinary process is not an exception in context of what is generally prevalent in the country now because the law is not very strictly implemented we start imposing very stringent conditions on our members if you look at section 144 of the companies act companies act says these are the services which an auditor cannot render to his audit client and there are host of services including bookkeeping and internal auditing one of the services which is mentioned there is be engaged for human resources services so if the auditing client is appointing uh, say people in the accounts department it would be quite common for the owner of the company to say sir you are the auditor please come and help me in selecting the right people but the law says no there will be a conflict of interest so you cannot as an auditor under section 144 render a service to your audit client for the for the purpose of appointing personnel in the in that company that is how section 144 is imposed under the international code of ethics they say and what they if we go into details what it says is if it is with respect to appointment of chief financial officer yes the auditor should not be involved because the chief financial <coughs> officer by reasons of his uh, designation would be involved in the process of selection of auditors appointment of auditors would be involved in the remuneration of auditors and the auditors would be commenting on his work so there would be a conflict between two people these two positions if the auditor is involved in the appointment of cfo then 
that cozy relationship would develop and therefore world over they say the auditor should not be involved for the purpose of appointment of CFO. But globally they say if it is appointment of CFO it is a different, uh, different uh, aspect. But if it is an appointment of a junior accountant who in no way is connected with the purpose of uh, selection of auditors or in all other things which the chief financial officer is engaged with. Then what is such a big harm if the auditor is also involved in the selection of junior accountants, non-qualified accountants, selection of people who do the stores accounting or material accounting and other aspects. But our act does not permit it. International Code of Ethics permit it. I believe we have been imposing these restrictions because we do not have that stringent implementation of law so as to distinguish between the services of a CFO or a junior accountant. And therefore the law puts a complete embargo. Now take the other example with respect to bookkeeping. All of us say and all of us agree that the auditor should not be involved in bookkeeping and writing books of accounts. International Code of Ethics would say that those vouchers which are only repetitive in nature and which do not require an application of mind, they can be processed by the accountant, by the auditor. So if it is a salary processing, how much salary is to be paid is fixed, how many days that person has worked in the company is determined by way of his attendance register, what are the deductions are prescribed under the law and if all this is there, they say that if the auditor is involved in the salary processing in a company and if he is engaged by the company to prepare the salary payroll accounting, there is no conflict of interest. And it is a very fine difference which we will have to bear in mind. And rightly so, in terms of only salary processing if you look at it, there is no conflict in my role as an auditor and the role I would play in terms of processing that salary uh, bills of that company. So while globally it was permitted under the International Code of Ethics, our Code of Ethics is more stringent, our law is more stringent. Section 144 would say that no, no kind of HR related services can be rendered by the auditor to the auditee. So these are aspects which are going to come to us when we are looking at situations more so in terms of transnational work which is going on. Today India is a very popular hub for uh, BPO and KPO assignments. But these aspects would also because the law is more centric for the Indian profession and therefore the law will have will always be the provisions of law will always prevail. And therefore an auditor would not be in a position to render such payroll accounting services to an audit client in India, whereas internationally it could be permitted. So what is ethically right or wrong would also depend on to what extent the law is implemented. And greater is the implementation of law, I think relaxation in certain aspects of ethical requirements can be considered as a matter for going forward. But these are not changes which would take place in near future. Today we have section 144 of the Companies Act. No amendment is proposed under section 144 and therefore the provisions of 144 would not permit an auditor to render such kinds of services to the holding subsidiary or even associates of an auditing client. Now in terms of governance, there are generally speaking eight elements which are there. It is rule of law. What governance talks about is having a fair legal framework that is enforced by an impartial, impartial regulatory body. For the profession of our, our profession in India, Hitherto it is only the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India working through the Central Council which is the apex regulatory body. Now we have National Financial <laughs> Reporting Authority 
which is stepping in as a direct regulatory body looking at the disciplinary matters and looking at quality review services of auditors of listed companies and certain larger companies as they have been prescribed under the NFRA rules. So governance requires rule of law, transparency, responsiveness, it has to be consensus oriented, it talks about the in equity and inclusiveness, effectiveness and efficiency, accountability and participation. So this is the broad framework within which the concept of governance would be looked at. In terms of our profession, we are looking at the Chartered Accountants Act's rules, prescribed rules under the Act which are framed by the central government and regulations which are framed by the Council of the Institute. In addition to that, we have certain pronouncements of the Council which are binding on us, which are mandatorily to be implemented. And in addition to that, we have this IFAC Code of Ethics, which was originally adopted in 2009 and which is now being revised with reference to the recent pronouncement issued by the International Ethical Standards Board and which, as we are told by our learned council member, our own local council member who happens to be the chairperson of the Ethical Standards Board for this year, that it is going to be made applicable from 1st of July 2020. So in terms of the provisions of the new code of ethics, we need to look at that to the extent there are more stringent provisions in the new code of ethics, they would be applicable to us. But otherwise it is the Chartered Accountants Act which would prevail and within the framework of the Act, whatever is permitted to be done or whatever is not permitted to be done, we will have to carry out our professional activities with reference to that. Now the Chartered Accountants Act, friends, as you know, there are two schedules which govern the concept of professional misconduct. The first schedule and the second schedule. First schedule is more of a matter between auditor and auditor, between a Chartered Accountant and Chartered Accountant. So matters like communication with the previous auditors, Matters like earlier this aspect was their undercutting of fees or part-time or full-time engagement in the profession. These are matters between the two professionals or the professional and the professional body. So these are matters which are covered under Schedule 1. Schedule 2 is between Chartered Accountant and the society at large. So whether the audit opinion is rightly given whether it conforms to the standards on auditing, whether the auditor has taken proper auditing procedures, whether he has expressed his opinion in accordance with the standards on auditing, are all those matters which are related to an auditor and a third person, that is the society at large and therefore these are matters which are covered under the second schedule. Contravention of any of the first schedule or second schedule is prescribed under the act and as we will see that the punishment which is prescribed for the first schedule is generally less as compared to the punishment which is prescribed under the second schedule because these are matters which are more related between an auditor and the society at large. So that is how these two schedules are covered under a, I don't intend to go through clause by clause analysis of those, schedule, those provisions of the schedules but some of the important aspects uh, I would touch upon. Now this is how our, uh, uh, our CA Act is covered with respect to the disciplinary proceedings under the Act which is a which has the statutory force of the law enacted by the Parliament. So we have a section 21 which talks about the disciplinary directorate then we have a board of discipline and we have a disciplinary committee. Board of discipline deals with the first schedule and disciplinary committee deals with the second schedule. Very far reaching amendments have been made in our act in the year 2006. In 2006, there was prior to that, there was a committee constituted by the government of India under the chairmanship of Sri Naresh Chandra 
and it was popularly referred to as Naresh Chandra Committee, where our then president of the institute, Mr. Ashok Chandak, was also a member of this committee. This committee was in the year 2002. Arising from the recommendations of that committee, by the time the law got changed, it was the year 2006, and we have these provisions which are brought in in the Chartered Accountants Act 2006, largely coming out of the amendments uh, suggested by the Naresh Chandra Committee. So we have Board of Discipline, Disciplinary Committee. Prior to 2006, there used to be a government nominee on the Central, on the Disciplinary Committee who would be a member of the Central Council. So any nominee of the Central Government on the Central Council, that government nominee would be a member of the Disciplinary Committee. So the members of the Disciplinary Committee would always be members out of the Council of the Institute. But after 2006, when there are government nominees on the Central Council, but those who are appointed on the committees, disciplinary committees, are not the council members and they are outsiders to the council who come and become members of the disciplinary committee. So today it is good that very senior retired IS officers and IRS officers, people of the rank of secretaries who have worked as secretaries government of India or people who have worked as chairpersons of Central Board of Direct Taxes are members of the Disciplinary <laughs> Committee and their presence also gives uh, public credibility to the work which is being done by the Disciplinary Committee. However, what is important is that right from 1949 till date, all the decisions of the Disciplinary Committee have been unanimous decisions. There is no case where because there is a majority of the central council members as compared to the government nominees, the decisions of the disciplinary committee have been issued by a majority vote. It is good that all decisions of disciplinary committee or board of discipline have been carried out in terms of a unanimous decision of that committee. Against the order of the disciplinary committee, there is an appellate provision which is an appellate tribunal which consists of five members. The chairperson of the tribunal is a retired judge of the High Court, two members nominated by Government of India and two members who are chartered accountants who are nominated to this appellate body. So in all there are five people in that appellate body and against the order of a disciplinary committee, the appeal lies before the appellate authority. Against the order of the appellate authority, only on a matter of law, it goes to the Supreme Court. So while the Honorable High Courts have their uh, writ jurisdictions on all matters under the powers given under the Constitution of India, but this law envisages that while a uh, decision of the appellate authority would be would not be challenged on a matter of law on an assumption that the chairman of the tribunal is a retired judge of the High Court and therefore against the decision of the appellate authority, the matter goes straight to the Supreme Court. It is true that the way the changes have happened in the disciplinary proceedings in, since 2006, the disciplinary proceedings have become much faster and the entire process has been reduced, the time involved has been substantially reduced on account of the changes which have been carried out under these provisions. The classic example is the case of Satyam. The Satyam event took place in 2009. The, one of the first biggest cases to be tried under the new Chartered Accountants Act amended after 2006 was the auditors and the managers of the company Satyam. Six people were charged and the disciplinary proceedings of these six persons which started in the year 2010 was completed by the year 2012. Thereafter, those members have gone in appeal before the appellate authorities, the decisions of the appellate authorities have been challenged even in the Honorable High Courts and presently before the Supreme Court. But as far as the disciplinary proceedings within the institute was concerned, it got completed in a short period of three years. So while there is a general criticism that the Indian, the, the disciplinary proceedings in the institute are far stretched and too, take too long a time, it also needs to be emphasized that after 2006, 
because of the change in the law, because of the change in the rules governing the process of disciplinary committee, the cases involving public interest have been completed in the council and the disciplinary committee at a very short period of time. The criminal proceedings against the, those auditors of Satyam were completed in the year 2015-16 and as against the professional proceedings which were completed in the year 2012. So our proceedings were much faster as compared to the proceedings under the general law. So it is not right for people outside our profession to keep criticizing that the process in the institute is it takes too long a time or people do not understand that only because chartered accountants are there, it is not so. There are non-chartered accountants, people who have been appointed by the central government, who are members of this disciplinary committee and as I mentioned that all decisions of the disciplinary committee have been by unanimous vote. Now some of the important matters relating to these proceedings are as we, as most of you are aware, there are two procedures. One is a complaint and second is a suo moto action being taken by the institute. So if somebody has finds that anything wrong done by me uh, on account of professional misconduct, anyone in the society can file a complaint against any chartered accountant. And second is if it comes within the media, it comes to the notice of the institute generally, even then the institute can suo moto take up the action against a chartered account. Now under the Companies Act with NFRA coming in, the law as it stands today is section 132 of the Companies Act provides that notwithstanding anything contained in any other law, any action which is initiated by NFRA, all other proceedings under the other law would be kept in abeyance. So if the council of the institute has initiated a disciplinary action, but later on if NFRA also initiates a legal action, a professional misconduct action against that auditor, the action initiated by the institute would come to an end and the action initiated by NFRA would prevail as is the provisions of section 132 of the Companies Act. Presently friends, there is a decision of Delhi, Honorable Delhi High Court which has stayed these powers of NFRA. So, NFRA powers uh, because that matter is still subjudiced before the Honorable Delhi High Court and as a result of that NFRA has not initiated disciplinary action against chartered accountants as of now but other activities of NFRA have commenced and they have started as many members here are aware uh, they have started registering the auditors of listed companies, they have started asking for annual returns, information from the auditors with respect to the audits done in a particular year, the fees charged, the time devoted, so on and so forth. A lot of voluminous information has been asked for and currently it is being compiled by our members and I guess uh, somewhere by first week of March is the last date when that information is to be filed before NFRA by the auditors of listed entities and auditors of certain specified companies. So NFRA has initiated other act, other powers which have been given to them under section 132 of the Companies Act but the disciplinary powers of NFRA have been presently stayed on account of the decision of Honorable Delhi High Court. Now in this meantime it is only the proceedings which are carried out by the Council of the Institute through disciplinary committee. Those powers and those uh, proceedings are in progress against the various audit firms maybe for uh, high profile audit failures or the other cases which go on from time to time. Now what is very interesting about this issue of professional misconduct is that who can file a complaint? Should the complainant be a person who has been aggrieved by a decision by an activity of a chartered accountant or anybody in the society can file a complaint. So the law is very clear. It does not say that or the law does not require the complainant to prove his locus standi. And therefore any person in the, in the country can file a complaint against any of the auditors, any chartered accountant anywhere in the country. Now, this is in, a, in some ways too vast 
So if you have audited a listed company, the complainant need not be a shareholder of the company. The complainant could be any person. And the local standard of that complainant is not to be questioned. The only thing is the auditor is required to demonstrate what he has done, how he has done on the basis of the applicable standards on auditing. So the local standard of complainant not being there, earlier the complainant could file a complaint only with 100 rupees fees and today also it is not a large amount, it is 2500 rupees which is the fees required for filing a complaint against chartered accountant. There are cases where these provisions are misused and there are cases where our members have been harassed, our members were tried to be blackmailed by some of the black sheep in the society by abusing the provisions of the Chartered Accountants Act. And many of our members have been unnecessarily put to trouble. But again, <laughs> the law still continues on the same foothold that the local standard of the complainant is not to be questioned. Similarly, once a complaint is filed, can the complaint be withdrawn? Earlier there was an ambiguity on this matters. Now there is a provision in the rules prescribed by the central government relating to the disciplinary proceedings. The rules say that the complainant can withdraw the complaint with the permission of the board of discipline. So there are cases which come up and in a way this is also a way one can look at for the protection of the auditors that the complainant if he is trying to blackmail a member and extract certain amount of money and says I will withdraw the complaint if you give me so much of money. In a way this provision protects me as a member of the institute in the sense that I know once he has filed a complaint his ability to withdraw the complaint is not there. It is not his choice. So once he has filed a complaint and he starts demanding money from me from any of our members, there is no way we should succumb to their uh, blackmailing tactics because even if he decides to withdraw the complaint, the withdrawal will be only with the permission of the board of discipline. So it is a, in a way a one way track and this is one important aspect which we should keep in mind because I have seen many cases where members feel that why and rightfully so I don't blame our members ki bhai, so the ability of the complainant to withdraw is only with the permission of the board of discipline. If the board is satisfied that it was a frivolous complaint, there is no merits in this complaint and now the complainant has become wiser and he is trying to withdraw this complaint, the board will permit him to withdraw the complaint. But if the case is Suppose one member files a complaint against another member saying that he has not communicated with me previously. And later on there is a settlement between two members and the complainant now says, no, I, he had communicated to me, I will withdraw my complaint. Such cases are not permitted by board of discipline. Generally such cases will not be permitted by board of discipline because if the communication with the previous auditor was done, by registered post AD or not, if it is not by registered post AD and the complainant now wants to withdraw the complaint, such complaints would not be permitted to be withdrawn by the board of discipline. So once that person has filed a complaint, whatever it is, as a respondent to that case, the member needs to ensure that he has to bring out whatever defense he has with respect to that matters. If he has erroneously by oversight forgotten to give a report to communicate with the previous auditor, I would feel that it is better to go clean before the board of discipline and say that this was oversight and I have mistakenly not communicated with the previous auditor. Now friends, earlier in such matters, the council would generally give a warning letter to the member that this is the first time you have done it, so you are warned Please be careful for the next time. It was only a warning letter. The effect of that warning letter is the in any proceedings if a member is asked has a disciplinary proceedings been initiated against you and were you 
penalized under the provisions of that. So the answer would be yes, disciplinary proceedings were initiated against that member, but no, I was not penalized. A warning letter is not a penalty. It is only, it is such a trivial matter, so counsel would say that this is a matter where only you require to be careful in future without being penalized. So technically, though there has been a breach, but the member has not been punished. Nowadays, of late or last few years, and as we all know, the regulatory regime is more stringent these days, the Board of Discipline is imposing a cost on the incoming auditor. Maybe 10,000, 20,000, 25,000, warning, etc. In some cases, removal of names also. So one has to be very careful in these matters these days. Earlier it was only a warning letter. Today there is a penalty which is imposed, not only a monetary penalty, but also in terms of removing of the name of a member, even for such trivial and inconsequential matters. So compliance in all these aspects needs to be more strengthened with respect to what is our obligations under the Chartered Accountants Act and what are our obligations under the, the concerned standards on auditing. My experience has been, friends, that in cases of companies, in cases of large commercial entities, all of us are very careful. But in cases of charitable societies, in cases of smaller trusts, smaller societies, we tend to help the trustees and society members putting faith on them, accepting whatever they say and carry out our professional duties. And most of the cases arise in such kinds of organizations where unfortunately there is a fight between the trustees, there is a fight between society members, there are umpteen number of cases of housing societies, particularly in Maharashtra and Mumbai, where the accounts of the housing societies are required to be audited. It's a small society of say 20 people. There's an auditor called in, they say there are, these are the receivables against 10 people. Then at the time the accounts are finalized, later on some people come and fight with the society members, say that we had already paid our dues to so and so person, you incorporate them in the financial statements. The society would change the financial statements and revise the financial statements. Again, our auditor will go and sign the same financial, revised financial statements, dating it back to the same date. <coughs> that is where the problems come in. And then there are two balance sheets. The uh, first containing different numbers as compared to the second financial statements. And these are cases where innocently our members get into trouble. So, more caution requires to be exercised with respect to smaller entities, charitable institutions, trusts, where our general tendency to rely on the trustees and society members being there is where the members get into a trap. Of course, larger organizations, larger audits, we have to be more careful and uh, in all cases we need to exercise the due diligence. But some of the smaller audits at times become what is uh, where our members fall prey to what they are saying. Certificates is a classic case. If you look at the certification work. Now, last year I believe one of the finest things which our institute has done is to broaden this concept of unique document identification number. UDIN has given us the power which we did not have till date. Today, if the audit, if the client comes and says, date many of us would have done it in good faith and given it to him. Now, thankfully, because of the requirement of UDIN, all of us can sit back and say, sorry sir, I can't issue this UDIN. Banks will come and say, provisional balance sheet I have signed. It's a common aspect. All of us would have experienced such kinds of requests from our clients where bankers tell them get it stamped from the auditors. Recently I had one of my clients coming in from one of the private banks saying that you have to sign the trial balance. 
आई सेड भाई तेरे कौन चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट है उनसे बात करा थे लकी नी दैट चार्टर्ड अकाउंट नाउ दे हैव हब्स द हब वाज इन भोपाल देयर वाज वन चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट आई कुड लोकेट ही कॉल्ड मी अप एंड ही कुड आई न्यू हिम एंड ही न्यू मी आई सेड हाउ यू आर आस्किंग द क्लाइंट्स टू गेट दिस स्टैंड यू नो आई कांट डू इट नो चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट कैन डू इट देन यू विल से सब सब करके देते हैं तो मैंने कहा सब करके देते हैं तो सब गलत कर रहे हैं इसका मतलब आप भी हमसे गलती कर रहे हो we have to stand firm and say this cannot be done and we are today also strengthened by udin and we can tell them that i have to generate udin i will have to say these are provisional numbers this will go against me it will go against you also so udin has been it is one very good thing which has happened in our profession it has imposed a lot of discipline on us in a way i believe it has strengthened our hands to do the rightful things which we always want to do and we need to look at compliance with the udin in the same manner last year because it was a new concept newly introduced it was given a period of 30 days the extension that there was a 30 days time window honestly if you ask me there is no need even of 24 hours it has to be in a disciplined manner the moment i sign before i sign i need to generate a udin it hardly takes couple of minutes to generate the util the technology being used by the institute is really very appreciable technology within minutes you get that otp and you can generate the util <coughs> however today there is a period of 15 days which is available and within those 15 days we need to be generating util in all these matters today with the litigation being what it is audit fees being too low which we are all aware of at the same time carrying out an assurance work we need to be careful and we need to be complying with the requirements coming back to this dc matters there is a period of 7 years earlier this period was 10 years for keeping the working files today it is reduced to 7 years so 7 years from the date of signing of the financial statements the auditor is required to maintain all audit working papers beyond 7 years if we are aware that there is if, if it is not in our knowledge that any proceedings have been initiated against us then the auditors would be justified in not keeping the working papers beyond 7 years practically we should be careful and it is not 7 years been 7 years sharp it is again at the discretion of the board of discipline general rule is 7 years in cases where if there is a public it is in media that there is some issues going on with respect to some kind of audits and tomorrow the auditor says that i have received the first notice only after 7 years the auditor can still be asked why did you not keep it because you are aware that these matters you could be asked at any point of time if there is a litigation going on on a particular claim before the department there have been instances where the tribunals have directed that cases be filed against certain auditors the auditors say that 7 years have gone back i don't have the working papers that may not be a defense because as a auditor you knew this matter is under litigation for this particular year and because of that you ought to have kept the working papers so 7 years is a general rule it did not mean that it is like income tax assessment that after 7 years the case cannot be reopened yahan pe the case can still be reopened even after 7 years so we need to work it out in that sense and keep working papers for a few years more then friends if you look at how the penalty under the chartered accountants act how the concept of penalty has evolved for a period of time as i said 2006 was a was a landmark year when lot of changes took place in our chartered accountants act prior to 2006 there was no concept of monetary penalty schedule 1 schedule 2 it said the powers for punishment was prescribed under the ca act was reprimand a member or remove the name of a member from the register of members so that was a time when the society and the profession believed that if i have been reprimanded by my by my institute 
that itself was so disgraceful for me that I have been reprimanded by my institute and that was considered as a punishment. Over a period of time, people started saying that reprimand, removal, this doesn't mean And therefore, 2006, when the law was amended, Schedule 1 prescribed a penalty of up to a maximum of 1 lakhs of rupees and under Schedule 2, there is a monetary penalty up to 5 lakhs of rupees which can be imposed on a chartered accountant for non-compliance with the respective provisions of the schedules. <laughs> So 2006, before 2006, no monetary penalties. Concept is that a professional would feel so disgraced even if he is reprimanded. But from 2006 onwards, we find that monetary penalties have been introduced. Now, Companies Act 2013, effective from 1st of April 2014, has imposed far more penalties, far more stringent penalties, both monetary as well as criminal penalties and uh, as we know that the provisions could result in payment uh, penalty up to 10 times the audit fees for any default uh, which is prescribed under section 139 to 147 of the Companies Act. So the pen concept of penalties has undergone a major change and it continues to keep on increasing. So 2014 onwards Companies Act has brought in this concept of monetary penalties. 2018, SEBI imposed penalties on an audit firm in case of Satyam itself, where that audit firm was uh, imposed a penalty of 12 crores of rupees for that audit. And not only that, they said for two years this firm cannot accept any audit of a listed entity. Whether SEBI has powers to impose these penalties or not was challenged before the appellate tribunal. Appellate tribunal by its very speaking order said that SEBI cannot impose these kinds of penalties because there is a special law under the Chartered Accountants Act and only the council of the institute can impose the penalties. Now SEBI has gone in appeal to the Supreme Court against the order of the SEBI appellate tribunal and today the matter is pending before the Honorable Supreme Court. It is only after the Honorable Supreme Court gives, gives an order we would know whether SEBI as of now has the powers to impose penalties on a firm or not. But it is a common knowledge other regulators like Reserve Bank of India have been blacklisting auditors and they would say that for a period of two years, three years we will not appoint these auditors for any of the banks and in a way they were also imposing a penalties on the firms. Now, all this is under uh, litigation before the Honorable Supreme Court. Even my apprehension is even if the court holds that today CB does not have the powers, I believe the law would be amended and those powers would be given. So, it is whether the powers are there today or not, but the, this kind of a threat would always continue and Huge penalties could come in on the auditors. Uh, now, take the case of Island FS. The auditors of the Island FS, the directors of Island FS, they have been charge sheeted by the Serious Fraud Investigation Office. Matters are before the NCLT, the matters are going before the uh, trial courts. Also, uh, after, uh, soon after the de decision of Delhi High Court, even NFRA would step in in those matters and disciplinary proceedings would continue. So if you look at the overall picture, we find that there is more and more uh, regulatory tightness with respect to the audit profession in particular and for the profession of, in general for all professionals, you can say that the regulatory regime or the penalties are becoming more and more strict. So these were the punishments earlier, reprimand, suspension up to fine, uh, suspension up to 3 months and fine up to rupees of 1 lakh under first schedule. These are the current uh, penalties prescribed under the CA Act for first schedule, suspension up to 3 months and for second schedule, reprimand, suspension for any period or permanent suspension and fine up to rupees 5 lakhs of rupees. 
uh, the provisions under the Chartered Accountants Act. If the penalty is imposed under the Companies Act by NFRA, they would be even more uh, over and above these penalties. Now friends, the Chartered Accountants Amendment Act 2006 has also brought in two very significant changes in the way we carry on our profession. Prior to 2006, the first schedule to the uh, CA Act provided that undercutting is a professional misconduct. So if I am charging certain fees and tomorrow Ankush is to uh, take up that audit, the requirement was that the incoming auditor cannot charge fees less than what I am charging. So this was with the concept that there is a healthy practice in the profession. If the new professional is to take up the assignment, it was expected that he should take it up at a higher remuneration. But after 2002, when the Comp Competition Act was enacted in the country, they said this is creating unfair competition. And if the auditee wants to appoint another auditor at a lower fees, it is not professional misconduct. Because the incoming auditor as well as the outgoing auditor under the law are expected to comply with the same technical standards. So what is the difference if the incoming auditor starts charging lower professional fees? Why should that be treated as a professional misconduct? And therefore from 2006, this undercutting as a professional misconduct has been removed. That is where the difficulties with respect to tendering and difficulties with respect to uh, lower charging of fees has come in and in some cases the fees has become so obnoxiously low that many firms would not like to do those kinds of audits at such lower fees. But 2006 onwards, undercutting is no longer a professional misconduct. <coughs> Second very important change which has been brought in by this CA Amendment Act of 2006 is that advertisements have been permitted, but the lawmakers have, the parliament has said, you are a well responsible profession. Normally you should not advertise, you should not solicit, but if your council prepares a guideline, within that guidelines, you can carry out, you can undertake advertisements. <coughs> so without spelling out what should be done in the law, very rightly I believe this is one very good amendment that the lawmakers have not stepped into the, into the shoes of the profession and said, do this, don't do this. They have left it to the council of the profession to decide to what extent you should advertise or you should not advertise. We have the advertisement guidelines of 2008. Those guidelines are also under, are in the process of being revised. And uh, as of today, hardly anyone would be advertising, but Advertisement is permitted and within the norms of the advertisement, permitted advertisements, if some people wish to advertise, it is no longer a professional misconduct. Now again, we need to look at what is happening globally. What has happened is, some firms which are global firms have built up a brand. So it is generally said, so and so big four firm is a very good firm. Nobody knows how good that firm is. But if something gets us a body for me, a chief for me, and get a international standards. So that is a brand. Now, Indian firms, as against that, the perception is this are your choti for me, you shall come nikar by me. So that is where brand building for smaller firms has not taken place. It's a, it's a uh, very relevant issue for the profession to deliberate as to how the brands of small and medium firms should also be developed. There is no clear cut answers to these issues. But if you go to any private organization, any large organization, they will take the name of four or five big firms which are known world over. Whereas in that city, those firms may not be present as is our case, our Indore. But we know that so many companies are still being audited by firms which come in from other cities. So it is not to find faults with those firms, but what is important is for us to ponder and discuss and decide what is the way we should build our brands. 
and how that brand can be built up in a meaningful manner, in a sustained manner. Today, our professional colleagues, our own Indian Chartered Accountants and large number of Indian Chartered Accountants working in places like say Dubai, Singapore, other places, they are competing with all international firms and our firms, are, our Indian CAs are also doing a very good professional practice and carrying out the profession in high hold. I mean they are being held in high esteem. They, as per the local laws, they advertise, they sponsor, they would go and do some advertisement activities which normally we would not be doing. Now has the time come when our firms should also be looking at advertisements, sponsorships, building brands in some way or the other. As I said, there is no solution to this, there is no fixed answer to this problem. But yes, we should recognize this as an issue more with respect to the local firms, smaller firms like ours and try and work out a solution. But this is one matter where the advertisement guidelines of the institute will have to be changed and things will have to be done differently and whether we are as individuals geared up to meet that kind of competition. Now, many of us, many may say that, okay, I have been in profession for last 30 years, so I don't like advertisement, I don't like this, but a younger member may say, why should I wait for 30 years? I want to build up my practice in 3 years, what others have done in 30 years. So, the requirements are changing. The expectations in the profession are changing. The mix of a profession is also changing. We know we have a number of younger members as compared to those members who qualified in the 80s and 90s and before that. Our profession had hardly one lakh of members till 2000. From 1949 to 2000, in the first 50 years, we are hardly one lakh to one lakh twenty-five thousand. In last 20 years, this number has grown to three lakhs. So 2 lakh members are members who are in profession for hardly for less than 15 to 20 years. Larger number less than 10 years. Again, the number of lady members in the profession have increased dramatically. So there is a demographic change in the composition of the profession. And the requirements of this demographic changed profession has different expectations, different aspirations. So matters like advertisements, solicitations, are bound to undergo a change and we need to gear up to meet those changes. Friends, uh, related to matters like charge, uh, advertisement, I thought I'd take up this matter related to percentage of fees. Our general understanding is that in the profession we cannot charge fees on percentage basis. In the early 2000, I came across this matter which is uh, at the bottom how it is not attractive. Generally we say percentage of fees and those provisions under clause 10 are attracted and a chartered accountant in professional practice cannot charge fees on a percentage basis. There was a very interesting issue which came up in the Himachal Pradesh. There was a state, state forest corporation of Himachal Pradesh. If you recall in the year 1997, there was a VDI scheme brought in by the government. And somewhere in 98-99, there was a Kar Vivad Samadhan scheme. KVSS. Now this forest company which was a government of Himachal Pradesh undertaking, it had some income tax cases in dispute and it approached its auditors, tax consultants, chartered accountants and they said you make an application under this KVSS and we want to close all these cases of 12 crores of uh, litigation which was there. The chartered accountant said, my fees will be 1%. He wrote a letter to the company. Company did not reply back. Company said, please go ahead and file this KVSS application. He filed that application for Karmivad Samadhan scheme. 
and the got that certificate which was issued. The litigation was closed. He raised his bills for 12 lakhs of rupees. So there was a dispute between the Forest Corporation and Himachal Pradesh Forest Corporation and the auditor. He took that, he filed a writ in the Shimla High Court before the Honorable High Court of Shimla and said there is a contract between Himachal Pradesh Forest Corporation and me. As per the contract, I was required to file this application under KBSS and I have done it. I had informed the corporation that my fees will be 1% and therefore I should be paid this fees. The Himachal Pradesh Forest Corporation took up a plea before the Honorable High Court saying that under the Chartered Accountants Act, he cannot charge fees on percentage basis. It's a professional misconduct. Very interesting judgment by Honorable High Court of Himachal Pradesh which said that first there is a contract between the company and the auditor. If there is a professional misconduct, those provisions will be under the Chartered Accountants Act. Here we are concerned with the contract between the client and the auditor. And they said, you have a contract. He gave you an offer. It is deemed to have been accepted. And therefore, the corporation is obliged to pay him 12, 12 lakhs of fees. Then the Honorable Court further went to say, that clause 10 and that was treated as a obita dicta not uh, because that was not the issue before the honorable court the court said that in this case what is prohibited is charging fees on con on a contingency it is in this case there is no contingency if the he has charged fees based on the amount of dispute if the fees was charged on the basis of relief that the corporation gets, then it is a contingency. Very fine difference. If the fees is charged based on dispute, it's a fixed amount. But if the fees was charged based on the outcome, then it is a contingency. So based on a contingency, he cannot charge. So the Honorable High Court said, even on this aspect, we do not believe this is a professional misconduct. The Himachal State Forest Corporation went in appeal before the divisional bench. And the divisional bench also appealed the order of the single judge. Then, because the issue whether it was a professional misconduct or not was not before the court, though the court had observed that there is no professional misconduct, the Himachal State uh, Forest Corporation filed a case in the institute against the chartered accountant saying that he has charged fees on a contingency basis, it is a professional misconduct. And they filed a complaint against that chartered accountant. And finally the council and the disciplinary committee also came to the same view that fees is not charged on a contingency basis. Fees is charged on a fixed amount. And therefore, there is no professional misconduct. This is a very important practical decision which we should keep in mind and we can take the benefit of this decision. So, if the matter in appeal is fixed, that 1 crore, 2 crores, 10 crores, if the fees is charged as a percentage of the disputed amount, then it is not a professional misconduct. But if I say I will argue your case and you will get a substantial relief, whatever relief you get, out of that give me this percentage, that is what is prohibited. So if I am in financial services service, if, and I go to a client and say I will apply to you to the bank for you for a, say 10 crores of loan, my fees is 1% of the loan applied for, then it is fixed. There is no contingency. But if I say 1% of the loan sanctioned to you, then that is a contingency. So, generally as professionals, it is said we should charge fees not based on percentage basis, but on the basis of whatever time we spend, whatever professional work, we, energy we spend on a particular assignment. But if somebody wants to charge fees on a percentage basis, 
I thought this is a very important decision which we should keep in mind. It has been upheld by the Honorable Decision, Honorable High Court of Himachal Pradesh on contract matters and it has been upheld also by the Council of the Institute so far as Clause 10 of uh, First Schedule of the CI Act is concerned. Friends, I will then take up through a uh, few aspects on standards and auditing and just wind up in the next five minutes. Not take you much through this, but uh, some of the aspects which we need to keep in mind is today we are talking about issuing an audit opinion. Standard 700 to 720 are the relevant standards. Audit opinion could be bifurcated into two parts. One is unmodified, that is a clean report which we are issuing. Second is a modified opinion. Modified opinion is in two parts. One is where the modification does not affect the audit opinion and second is where the modification affects the audit opinion. So not affecting the opinion which is on the extreme right side is where we give an emphasis of matter as per SA 706 and where it is a modification affecting the opinion there is a qualified adverse or a disclaimer and this is what is governed by uh, SA 705 and what we also need to keep in mind is uh, in case of listed companies uh, SA 701 uh, regarding uh, uh, 701, 710, 720, 701 with respect to key audit matters, 710 with respect to comparatives and 720 with respect to other matters where now it is important that the auditor should have read what is there in the other matters, the director's report, management discussion and analysis and see that there is no contradiction between what is the information given in that portion and the audited, audited financial statements. Recently friends, I saw one case where the registrar of companies Madhya Pradesh had issued a notice to one of our colleagues in the law saying that in the audit report you say there is only one business segment and Whereas in the director's report and in the MDA, it is said that company has multiple business segments. So fortunately, that year SA 720 was not applicable, so it was not a responsibility of the auditor to see what is there in the other matters. But these are the kinds of issues which come up that there is a contradiction between what the directors say in the financial statements and what the directors say in the other reports. Primarily because the other reports are prepared by other professionals and financial statements are prepared by we as chartered accountants and auditors while other professionals are involved for the purpose of preparation of director's reports and at times there is a mismatch between the two and that is why we need to look at SA 720 very clearly. So with that friends, uh, I would close my presentation. There are some more things with respect to auditors, auditing standards which I may skip on account of paucity of time. Uh, if there are any issues, uh, we can take up for discussion. <laughs> so, Chopra ji has already arrived, he is taking a session in the other workshop. Which is huh. Okay, fine. So, we can also have a query session. <laughs> and uh, a query session or any other matter which members may like to discuss. Sir, आप query पूछ रहे हैं कि आप query का जवाब देंगे आप किसी को पर generally the companies the depends that the so let me extend a hearty welcome to श्री अमरजीत चोपड़ा जी and sir you would not have come in at a better time because the query session has started and in your presence, I am now more important to answer the queries. <laughs> so, Kaskar Rasa, you can ask any question now. <laughs> so, the standard is saying that you take a draft. And what we say in the audit report, we have read that. Nothing has come to our notice. But many a times the draft practically may not be available in the same form. But as an audit evidence, I would suggest we should have a draft signed by the managing director 
that this was a draft given to me on the date of before the finalization of the accounts. And I have read that draft. That draft should be available with us as a working papers. You can give a disclaimer. आप disclaimer दे सकते हैं, but सब तक लिख रहे हैं कि we have read. आप देखें key audit matters में कुछ forms ने जो लिखा वो ही सब में लिख दिया key audit matters है। उसमें क्या क्या लिखा कि we have done all this और वो उसके working file में होना चाहिए कि he has done all that. Yes. So these are challenges, but at least matters like difference in business segments will not come in if you have read it. अगर आपने पढ़ाओ तो आप बिल्कुल ऐसा वहाँ पे तो एक सेगमेंट है यहाँ पे दो सेगमेंट्स कर दिया आपने। Or if the management still persists with that, then you have to give a qualification or a disclaimer that that information. So you are responsible for what is in the financial statements. Having read the other reports, if there is any inconsistency which comes to your notice, you need to point it out. So with that, uh, I would conclude my presentation.